fabrication and falsification of data, plagiarism, and unreported conflicts of interest are considered outright violations of research integrity. But there is also a gray area of practices referred to as questionable research practices, or QRPs. Questionable research practices refer to practices that are acceptable if they're implemented objectively and responsibly, but they can be abused to obtain more favorable results. These practices generally refer to selective manipulation or massaging of data and selective reporting of results. Different types of QRPs can be distinguished. I'll discuss harking, p-hacking, cherry-picking, and selective omission here. Harking is short for hypothesizing after results are known. This means the hypothesis is adapted to fit the observed data. Of course, researchers are allowed to formulate new hypotheses based on the data they collect. This is basically what drives scientific progress forward. Harking becomes a questionable research practice if the adapted hypothesis is presented as the original hypothesis, without referring to the true original hypothesis. This is a highly questionable thing to do, because results that independently confirm an a priori hypothesis can be considered relatively strong support for a hypothesis. But here, the hypothesis was a posteriori, formed after the fact. And hindsight is 2020, meaning that it's easy to find an explanation that fits a specific result. Prediction is much harder. Also, adaptation of the hypothesis based on the results, means that the original hypothesis was not confirmed. This failure to support a hypothesis forms useful information for other researchers who are investigating the same phenomenon. This information is lost if the original hypothesis is never reported. Let's turn to the questionable research practice of p-hacking. A statistical test is often used to determine whether an effect, a difference between groups, or a correlation between variables, is large enough to be considered a confirmation of the hypothesis. In most cases, a probability, called a p-value, is used to decide this issue, hence the term p-hacking. p-hacking refers to data manipulation, or selection, that makes the results, in effect the p-value, more favorable. Data manipulation could consist of transforming scores. Data selection could consist of selecting only certain items in a questionnaire, using only certain variables, or removing one of several experimental conditions. These selection and manipulation methods can be harmless if they're performed for good reasons. For example, because scores are heavily skewed, questionnaire items are unreliable, or certain variables or conditions show too much missing values to provide valid results. However, Sometimes, these methods are employed just because it produces a more favorable p-value. The confirmation or rejection of the hypothesis thereby depends on arbitrary choices of data selection and manipulation. The golden rule of p-hacking is that as long as data selection and manipulation are reported and arguments are provided, the reader can judge for himself whether these choices are justified. P-hacking becomes a serious questionable problem when the data massaging is not or incompletely reported. A special form of P-hacking is cherry-picking, reporting only results that are favorable and significant. For example, only one out of three experimental conditions and only one of two dependent variables. The opposite of cherry-picking is selective omission. Selective omission refers to the omission of non-significant results, but also omission of results that contradict the hypothesis. A last specific type of p-hacking I want to mention is data snooping. Data snooping refers to the collection of data exactly until results show a favorable p-value. This practice is problematic because the choice to stop is arbitrary. Suppose the results are significant, the p-value is small enough, after collecting data from, let's say, 79 participants. It's entirely possible that the results will be unfavorable again if the data for two more participants are included. Confirmation could be based on a fluke or extreme data from one participant. The confirmation of a hypothesis should not depend on inclusion of data from an arbitrary participant that just happens to pull the results far enough in the hypothesized direction. 
Sample size should be determined beforehand, based on non-arbitrary estimates of the expected effect size of a treatment and the required confidence level. Again, the golden rule in all these cases is that as long as choices are reported, they can be discussed and their influence on the results can be evaluated. If choices are not reported, these practices can result in serious misrepresentation of results, with no way to correct these errors.